All right, folks, we are live. Potential Theism here. My name is Jordan. I am the Potential Theist. I have a very <laughs> special guest here today, Dale C. Allison Jr. Dale, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us on Potential Theism. Uh, so why don't you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay, well, I'm a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary uh, here in Princeton, New Jersey. I suppose I'm best known as a New Testament scholar. So I am an historian, I guess. And uh, my specialty has been to approach uh, the historical Jesus and early Christian texts through uh, a Jewish matrix. Um, rather, you know, some people focus on the Greco-Roman world and the New Testament. I focus on the Jewish world and the New Testament. In addition to that, I suppose I'm an amateur theologian or a wannabe amateur theologian, something like that also. So I occasionally write books on subjects outside the field of, of uh, New Testament. So basically that's who I am. Okay, so the name of the channel obviously is Potential Theism. And so I always wanna ask questions for folks in the audience who may be in a similar position that I'm in. So I'm an ex-Christian. Uh, I left the faith when I was in seminary. Uh, I know that's a common experience for a lot of ex-Christians. Maybe they were involved as I was in apologetics. And so as they're exploring the possibility of coming back into the faith, one of the things that's difficult for me is I sort of have this expectation that I feel I've placed on myself that if I'm gonna come back to the faith, it's gonna to have to be through arguments. So when we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus, you know, when, when I'm reading books like yours, it's really helpful because it helps liberate me from that expectation. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, what you talk about in the book, which is that you don't think that the, it's a slam dunk on either side for the apologist or the skeptic. Well, so first of all, let me let me try to draw an analogy. So I'm old enough that I can actually remember the day uh when President uh, Kennedy was shot, so 1963. Uh, I was very young, but I remember it. And since then, I've read lots of books on this assassination. And do you know what? I'm not exactly sure what happened, but this was an event that was partly filmed. There were tons of people there. The Secret Service was there. Uh, it's been investigated officially and unofficially. Nonetheless, I'm still not sure exactly what happened. And it seems to me that that's the case often uh, in history. And certainly if it's sometimes the case in recent history, how strange is it that people think that they can go back 2000 years and look at four or five sources, which is what you're, do, you're dealing with when you're, you're talking about the, the resurrection of Jesus. You're looking primarily at four canonical gospels and the apostle Paul and convince an uninterested audience or an open-minded person exactly what happened. I don't think it's very likely that that's going to be the case. So one of the things I do in the book is um, I, I, I end up concluding that if you want to take a Christian uh, interpretation of these events, nothing prevents you from doing so. Actually, I think that, that what we can likely reconstruct is a remarkable series of events uh, without close parallel to my knowledge. On the other hand, playing devil's advocate and trying to be fair, I don't see how you can prove to a skeptic that Jesus uh, was raised from the dead. And so one of the things I do in the book is I offer a, an alternative scenario, a skeptic scenario, and then try to defend it. And we can talk about the details if you want. But my point here <clears throat> is simply that um, I, I think that your view of the resurrection isn't going to be determined simply by historical considerations. I think there are all sorts of other things going on. For example, I know that there are many people who don't believe in miracles. And for them, that's just a surety. They don't happen. That's it. And if you start with that, I don't see how the evidence in the New Testament is going to um, overthrow that in and of, it, of itself. There are larger questions here besides uh, the historical evidence from the New Testament. There are larger questions about the nature of the world, the nature of God, if there is a God, um, 
what can and cannot happen in the world, what does and does not happen in the world and so on. There are just so many other questions and they influence how you construct the data, how you interpret the text, how you approach uh, everything. So when you take that in, to mind, it's not confusing at all that there's a spectrum of opinion and different explanations and so on. That's just what you would expect from what is, uh, in essence, um, uh, an event that took place 2,000 years ago for which we do not have um, an abundance of evidence. It's nothing like the Kennedy assassination. And as I said, I'm still kind of, I'm still uncertain about what exactly happened uh, on that occasion. And as you know, books come out every year with new proposals on what really happened and was the CIA involved and so on and so on and, and so on. Was there a lone gunman? Um, anyway, it just strikes me if we're still debating that and talking about that. And, and I would say it's not just weird conspiracy people who have questions, if sensible folks can have questions about what happened in 1963 then it's probably gonna be the same uh, way back then in the year 30 or 33, whichever one it was. Okay, so you brought up your skeptical scenario that you lay out in the book. Why don't you lay that out for our audience and then maybe give some of the responses that you've heard from apologists to it. Well, so first of all, I'm not sure that I have heard yet uh, responses or adequate, adequate responses from apologists. Um, somebody told me last week there's a book coming out that will uh, engage my work to some extent. Uh, I don't know whether that's true, but my, my skeptical scenario said, all right, we'll, we'll do two things. First of all, we'll accept the um, apologist's claim that Jesus prophesied his own death and resurrection. That's the first thing we'll do. The second thing we'll do is we'll say, well, the tomb was empty, but it was empty because the body was stolen. There was a market for corpses in antiquity. It's very strange to us, but um, we know a lot about the market in uh, corpses. Uh, different parts of corpses um, were used in magical recipes. There are novels about witches who steal bodies. Tombs are marked, telling people not to enter and they'll be cursed if they do and so on. So there's a lot of evidence. I don't think anyone doubts that there was a trade in, in bodies. So a skeptic could say, well, you know, uh, we, have a, we know that uh, the bodies of people who died violently feature in some recipes. So some people stole Jesus's body. That would explain why they did it at night because they were undercover and it was against the law. It would also explain why the stove was rolled away because they're not gonna take time to go back and, and uh, do that. They're just gonna take the body and run. And then the third thing would be just to appeal to um, bereavement visions. It's, it's, a, it's the case, it's uh, well known that uh, people often see the newly departed and if you're a skeptic, you're going to assume that all those, all of those stories uh, are bunk or th that at least they're endogenous, that is, they are projections. By the way, um, I I'm very interested in this phenomenon of visions myself because I actually did have somebody who was three days dead, ostensibly or apparently, uh, appear to me uh, after, after death. And... Um, whether that was real or whether that was my imagination, uh, it doesn't matter. The point is, it really happens to people. So if you if you say that the disciples expected resurrection or that the category was given to them by Jesus and then some people stole the tomb and then two or three people, maybe Mary Magdalene, maybe Peter had bereavement visions, then maybe that, that that's how we get everything uh, going. This is different than many other skeptical scenarios. I suppose most skeptical scenarios just assume there wasn't an empty tomb. They want to make it mythology. I think that it's more likely than not that there was an empty tomb and that therefore the skeptic should um, try to explain that, but I think you can do it. I think I just gave uh, an explanation that while, a, a, while an apologist will want to attack it and find weaknesses in it, I think a skeptic could say, yeah, okay, I can go on with my life now. I don't have to worry about that. 
again, I do think while we can say some things when it comes to this question of whether God raised Jesus from the dead, that's not something for historians to decide. Historians can say things like, well, it's more likely than not that the tomb was empty. And the historian can say, well, some people were convinced that they had uh, seen Jesus after his death. And uh, Acts refers to Paul's experience as visionary. So some of these early Christians uh, were seeing Jesus. But how do you go beyond that to then invoke uh, a particular a Christian interpretation of, of everything? Um, another thing that makes this so difficult and I don't think apologists have wrestled with, is that I, I actually know uh, some secular people who don't have any trouble thinking Jesus rose from the dead. I know some Hindus who say, well, Jesus was an incarnation of Vishnu uh, or Krishna, and uh, it doesn't surprise anybody that he came back to life. Uh, I know some Buddhists who say, well, we have a phenomenon called rainbow body, and it involves sages uh, disappearing into light shortly after they die and then communicating with uh, their disciples. So we, we, we can fit this into our religion. The point is that you can take the data and you can interpret it or configure it in multiple ways. So for me, the big question after you get done with history is worldview and what do you think of God or what are the possibility of miracles and so on and so on. But the historical facts, the data that you can uncover do not seem to me to force you to be a skeptic and they don't force you to be uh, a Christian of some sort. And uh, by the way, I might add that my view is empirically supported because lots of people have read books by skeptics and not changed their minds. And lots of people have read books by apologists and not changed their minds. So it's just an empirical fact that people have looked at different cases and said, I'm not convinced. Okay, so you brought up books that apologists write that people read and that they don't change their mind. I, I think about something that Gary Habermas has put forward, like the minimal facts approach. So uh -huh. what do you make of that approach and where do you think it falls short? So I think that the minimal facts approach is the best of the apologetical arguments. So I think uh, Gary is right to pay attention to that. Uh, Mike Lacona has another version of that. I, uh, but my skeptical approach doesn't deny any of the minimal facts, does it? My skeptical approach has Christians thinking Jesus rose from the dead the first week uh, after the crucifixion. It has the tomb empty. It has people convinced that they've seen Jesus. Uh, so it accounts for all the minimal facts, because one of the things I hear is there's no skeptical scenario that accounts for all the minimal facts. Yeah, so maybe I'm missing something here, and maybe Mike or Gary can uh, rebuke me appropriately, but... Uh, I don't know what it is. I think at some point in the book, I just said, here, here are the minimal facts and my skeptical approach satisfies them. So uh, they, don't, they don't compel. By the way, I should add here that I am a Christian, all right? I'm not an ex-Christian, I'm a Christian of a sort and liberal sort. I just don't expect as an historian that I can get so much out of history as some of the apologists uh, think we can. That, that's where I'm differing with them. Are you familiar with Lydia McGrew's critiques of the minimal facts? Uh, <laughs> look, I have to be careful here. I'd rather say nothing about uh, Lydia McGrew. She has a, a video on me, uh, which I find very unpleasant and uncharitable, and I'd prefer not to say anything uh, on that subject, okay? You're, you're, okay? I'm welcome to listen to you summarize her if you want to. So the approach that they take is they say that a lot of the minimal facts apologists rely too heavily on Paul and that if you're going to defend the resurrection of Jesus, you're going to have to go to the Gospels and defend the historical reliability of the Gospels. So that's basically I, their approach. Okay. So um, I don't have any problems with that because I'm not in her camp and I'm not in the other camp. I think with as much as we have taking into account everything, you still have um, you still have a gap 
between possible explanations and the likely facts. Just an explanatory gap. Uh, under determination of theory by data is what the scientists would call it. We have data, but we have multiple ways uh, of explaining that data in, in my judgment. So I'm going to respect that you don't want to talk about Lydia McGrew, but one of the things she <laughs> has done is questioned your faith. And I think some Christians have questions about your view of the bodily resurrection. So could you clarify what your view is of the bodily resurrection of Jesus? So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I would hope that people would uh, respect my conviction that I am a Christian. I, um, I teach at a seminary, I go to church, I'm very pious in my own ways. I have uh, uh, a rather lengthy and complex uh, prayer and meditation routine I'm involved in every day. I spent my whole life studying uh, Christian scriptures. Uh, my favorite people in the world are all Christian uh, figures. So um, I, I don't really understand this sort of slander, but um, Maybe I'm just confusing because maybe there are people out there who don't think that liberal Christians can be Christians or somebody like me who can say, well, I think the tomb was empty. And if God did it fine, if it turns out not to be empty, then that doesn't trouble me. Uh, I personally have philosophical questions about the relevance of human bodies uh, in the world to come or in the afterlife. And I'm just being honest about those questions and my doubts. So I just end up being confused about some things, but I'm confused about lots of things. I'm, and I'm not certain about uh, very many things. I have lots of hopes. I have lots of dreams. I have convictions, but um, I'm sure I'm wrong about many things. And uh, if somebody wants to say, well, he can't be a Christian because he's confused about what exactly risen bodies are, or uh, uh, he doesn't really want the tomb to be empty or uh, thinks it will, might be okay theologically if it wasn't, well, uh, look, that's for other people, uh, I guess, to, to worry about. I'm just being honest. That's all I'm doing. So sort of, <laughs> I actually had a mythicist kind of claim the opposite about you. They, they told me because you teach at a Presbyterian seminary that you can't be trusted because you're pretty much an apologist. So I thought it was sort of funny. You get you get both ends there. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, I get both ends because I'm, I'm not skeptical or liberal enough and I'm not too con conservative enough. But all I can say is that I'm just where I am and uh, I've done my best to try to think conscientiously. And I also think at the end of the day that whoever made that comment wasn't really thinking because it's not a question of trusting me. Nobody has to trust anything I say or trust my character. All that matters is I've written a book and it's full of arguments. And so you can evaluate the arguments. That's how we make decisions. We don't just say, oh, I like that person or I trust that person or that person believes in God. So I won't pay any attention to the arguments. I'm per perfectly happy to follow the arguments of people I disagree with or people I disagree with fundamentally and look for problems with the argument. So I think that's what we used to call, I don't know what we call it now um, in a, our feminist or post-feminist age, used to be called an ad hominem argument, right? You're attacking the person, the man, rather than uh, the arguments. Uh, who cares about me? Just look at the arguments. That's, that's all I'm interested in. That, that's why I write the book. I didn't write the book uh, so that people would trust me. I wrote the book to say, look, here are some arguments. Here are some observations. Uh, if you want to think about them, that's it. I'm not claiming any authority at all. So you, give your, assessment, you give your assessment of arguments that are put forward by apologists and skeptics. So let's start with apologists. Are there some arguments that you hear from apologists that you think are overreaches or you just don't think are very good that you keep hearing over and over again? Well, sure. I have a little chapter in the book where I discuss some of these. Um, 
sometimes in the literature you'll you'll have people say that you can't explain Sunday without the resurrection because the first Christians were um, Jews and they they celebrated the Sabbath. I, I, that's a really complicated question um, where Sunday comes from. But all you need is that Christians believe that Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. It doesn't it doesn't prove anything to my mind. You also occasionally will find the argument that well we have this wonderful church and look at the the two thousand years of history that it's given us and it, it it didn't come from a charlatan and so on. Um, I suppose I'm a little sympathetic to this because um, I think the Christian tradition has produced some truly amazing, wonderful, fantastic people, people that I love very deeply, people that I know from books and people that I've known um, from real life. But church history is not just uh, is, is not just wonderful people doing good things. Church history is also a mess and it's full of ugly and terrible and horrible things. And I personally think the church is just like anything else human. Uh, it's a it's a mixture of, of things. So I don't know how to argue from church to to uh, to resurrection. I certainly don't know how to argue from the success of Christianity. Success judged in numbers. Uh, Islam has done pretty well. Islam continues to do pretty well. I don't think that the continued ongoing success of Islam tells us exactly who Muhammad was. Does that tell us whether he was really a prophet? or where the book of, uh, where, the, where the Quran came from? I, I don't think so. Um, another argument that I'm not, um, I'm not big on uh, is the Shroud of Turin. Uh, actually, I was recently filmed. I was filmed uh, for a documentary that's coming forth very soon on the Shroud. And I'm, I don't know if I'm the only skeptic or one of two skeptics, but, uh, I, I'm not on board with that. So, you know, some some people uh, have wanted to say that's sort of an extra apologetical plank, but I don't I don't think so. So anyway, those are some of the arguments that that you will see repeatedly in um, in the apologetical literature that I, I just think are I don't, at the best really weak and tenuous at the best. Okay, and how about for skeptics? What are some arguments you hear from skeptics that you don't think uh, are very good? Well, the the first one, I suppose, is the big one, and the big one is always up front and its center, which which is that miracles don't happen. Um, now, I have a, a strange worldview, which is that inexplicable things happen. So, just set aside the question of God divine intervention, Satan, uh, transcendent forces. I actually think that the historical record contains events that we cannot explain. I also believe that in my own life, I've seen a few things that make no sense at all. And they're the sorts of things that David Hume uh, or my friend Bart Ehrman would say couldn't happen. But They've happened to me, so I, be, I believe them. So for me, the question of, of miracles uh, actually begs the question. Uh, but in addition to that, I, I think that this is a very strange place and that strange things go on. The hardest part of that is to decide whether anything is caused directly by God or not. But um, anyway... Um, also, you'll often hear skeptics say that um, there are too many inconsistencies in the Gospels, but as an historian, that doesn't bother me. All you're looking for is the traditions that they have in common, not how they have diverged or not how the different editors have expanded them and, and, and so on. And it seems to me they agree on uh, the central details, which is that some women... Uh, including Mary Magdalene, found uh, the tomb empty, and that um, there this was followed by 
an appearance or multiple appearances of Jesus. And this all happens very rapidly after the crucifixion. Uh, so that doesn't bother me at all. This is actually what you get everywhere if you're doing history. Even if you're doing eyewitness history, you'll find eyewitnesses uh, disagree with each other all the time. So it's not a question of finding disagreements and saying they can't be trusted. It's a question of finding what they agree on and then saying, is that possibly historical? Um, another uh, objection that is really common is that Jesus only appeared to insiders. And I, I read this numerous times. I, I think that's an odd uh, objection because first of all, Paul is, was not an insider. He was an outsider. That, that's the first thing. And the, the, the second thing is that I think this is an odd, very odd uh, contention in terms of, of human psychology, because I, I would bet anything that if Jesus appeared before the leader of the Sanhedrin or before Pontius Pilate, they would just look at him and say, I'm hallucinating. I don't believe this. Uh, I must have eaten something uh, terrible. It's, you know, made me. Uh, see this. Um, in the book, I cite several examples of, of people who don't believe their own eyes simply because uh, they don't want to. So I actually think that while Paul is an outsider, on some level of his psyche, he was open to the possibility of this encounter, and that's why uh, he welcomes it. Um, it's interesting that one of the notes repeated in the Gospels is that they doubted, or some of them doubted, uh, if people who were followers of Jesus could doubt, I am sure that if, I don't know whether Jesus appeared to you know, other people, but if Jesus ever appeared to somebody outside other than Paul, I'm sure their doubts would be far more than those of the, that the disciples had. It's always possible to doubt your own experience. Okay, so sometimes I hear apologists, they'll put a lot of weight on the appearance of the 500. They'll say things like we have 500 eyewitnesses to the risen, uh, to the risen Christ. Which the appearance of the 500 and a claim like that is doing a lot of heavy lifting. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the appearance of the 500 and if you think that has any or that much apologetical value. I don't think it has any apologetical value. Um, we don't know anything about these people. We don't know where they were. We don't know why they were brought together. What were they? Why were they together? Why were 500 of them brought together? Had they already heard? Um, that Jesus had been raised from the dead, where they gathered together, where they're all excited, where they're all looking forward to, to something. Uh, we don't know any of this. We don't know who these people were. We don't know what kind of an appearance this was. We don't know if this was an appearance uh, in the heavens, right? We don't know. We don't know if it's some something else. I don't know how you build a case on this. So uh, Protestants never pay attention to Roman Catholics who will say, well, multiple people saw Mary or hundreds saw Mary or dozens saw Mary. They just dismiss those. So why, why are they uh, latching on to this? The other thing, again, if you're a skeptic, um, you can go on the internet and you can find pictures of Jesus in the clouds. Now, I don't know that this happened. I don't believe this happened, but I don't know how an apologist dismisses it. Uh, I spent a lot of time when I was young looking at clouds. I could always find George Washington in the clouds. I could always find horses in the clouds. I could find shapes in the clouds. If you look at the internet, there are people who are finding pictures of Jesus in the clouds. And look, the apologist has no idea what happened. None, zero, whatever. Um, so I don't know what happened. I don't know how you do anything with this. It's quite possible that if I were there and, and could observe what happened, I would be truly mystified or I would say, yeah, that's Jesus uh, and so on. Uh, I don't know how the skeptic gets a around that, but I don't know how the apologist puts, puts any weight on this at all. Uh, and by the way, uh, Early Christians had a lot of traffic between different areas and different cities. You know, at the end of Romans, Paul is sending greetings. Everybody seems to know everybody. But when it comes to the 500, um, Paul doesn't say, and Jesus appeared to the 500. 
uh, among whom are, and then he, you know, could could have given them a couple of names of people he knows. He doesn't. He doesn't do that. The other thing is that that little formula in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, doesn't tell you when to th this appearance to the 500 took place. What if it was after Pentecost? What if most of these people are already Christians? What if they're already primed for whatever event it was? Um, there's a tradition, it goes back to Constantine or the people around Constantine, uh, you know, that he had a vision before uh, his great uh, victory, uh, the Melvin Bridge. So, you know, people see things in the sky and then interpret them in a particular way. So I just look, I, I, I suppose I'm sounding like a skeptic here. But what I'm a skeptic of is the force of an apologetical argument that does anything with the 500. You just have to assume that they were all sensible, sane, unexcited, objective people who really did see Jesus. And that's just begging all the questions. Would you say that the evidence for some of the modern uh, Marian apparitions is better than, say, the appearance of the 500? Because we have newspaper clippings. We have eyewitnesses that are still alive. We have their affidavits, so on and so forth. Yeah. So, um, yes, I think, for example, that the appearances of Mary or whatever it was in Zaitun, Egypt, at St. Mary's Coptic Church, in 1968, 69, 70, I think those are uh, incredible events. I have no explanation for them, by the way. Um, so I don't know if your viewers know anything about this, but um, in 1968, a uh, couple of folks were walking in front of St. Mary's Church in Zaitun. Zaitun is a, is a suburb of Cairo. And they looked up on the church, uh, up by the dome, and they thought they saw a young lady or a nun, and they thought maybe she's going to jump off and she's going to commit suicide. And uh, one of them went to uh, get the police. And when he came back with the police, some other people had gathered around. They were all pointing up there. And one of them said, it must be Mary. And uh, this idea caught hold. And about every week, for months and months and months and months after that, sometimes twice a week, there would be this light apparition in the night. And uh, there are pictures of it. There were secular journalists there. Uh, we have testimonies, great, a great number of testimonies of people uh, who saw this. I had a student, I live in New Jersey, so I had a student who was a Coptic priest write a paper on this few years ago, he just went around to the Egyptian diaspora here in New Jersey and interviewed a bunch of people, put their firsthand accounts together. There's a book coming out next year that's the most complete uh, account of this event. And uh, it, I, don't, I, I know of no explanation for it. It was investigated at the time by critical uh, uh, city authorities. A actually, at one point, they cut off the church's electrical grid to see if the lights would still be there, and they were still there. The crowds got so big, they cut down trees and destroyed some buildings. Anyway, this is really well documented, and I think it makes my point. If you are a Coptic Christian, Coptic Christians will say, oh, also some people were healed. They brought sick people, and, and they were healed, and so on. A Coptic Christian will say, this is obviously Mary. It, it's it's her church, and uh, we all saw it. Everybody saw it, and you just have to be a skeptic to doubt it. But I come from a religious world which doesn't really know what to do with appearances of Mary. So I look at this, and I say, I don't know what that is, but I'm not going to deny that there was this light phenomenon and that it was seen by literally hundreds of thousands of people over months. Uh, and it does seem to me that's way better attested than the resurrection of Jesus. And again, when I look at it, I actually don't come to a conclusion. People who are already inclined to believe certain things about Mary have no trouble saying, yeah, that's Mary. But if you don't, and you're honest with the evidence, you just have to scratch your head and say, wow, this is 
dumbfounding. Um, the book that's coming out next year on this is actually written by a philosopher, and his conclusion is not Mary appeared. It's rather that there is no reductionistic, materialistic, uh, reasonable explanation of this event. It's just a, an unknown. So I, I actually think this is a little like the Kennedy assassination. It's really well attested. There is no doubt this happened. Absolutely zero. We've got tons of firsthand testimony, yet it still leaves you, unless you're already inside the system, already inside the Coptic church or you're Catholic and you have no trouble thinking Mary makes appearances and so on. If you're not already in it, you just have to say, that's a something I know not what. And I, so I don't know why you, why you couldn't do the same with the resurrection if you wanted to. So I find it interesting that someone like Mike Lacona, for example, uh, when it comes to the resurrection, obviously he goes along with the minimal facts and argues for the resurrection uh -huh. from, the, from that approach. But then when it comes to the Marian apparitions, I know in one blog that I saw, he, he seemed to suggest that it could possibly be demonic activity taking place. So I'm wondering what you make of Protestant apologists who seem to become skeptics when it comes to Marian apparitions. Yeah, uh, so I, I think that there are some issues there. So uh, one thing is they're always telling skeptics to keep an open mind, right? When it comes to considering the evidence and then they don't seem to be so open-minded uh, with, re with regard to this evidence. The other thing is that you can, in fact, invoke demons for anything. There's no empirical evidence for them. Uh, Christians have done this with other religions down through history. I think it's one of the worst things about us to look at people with their own stories and say, well, uh, if those happen, they must be done by demons. Justin Martyr already does that. I dislike this in part because this was already, as you remember, done to Jesus. So Jesus appears to have been a successful exorcist. And what did some of his critics say? They say, well, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. So they're just doing what uh, some other people do down the road. I just think it's too easy. I think it's a sort of lazy argument. I don't like it at all. And uh, what it comes down to is miracles that support my faith, I believe in, but miracles that don't support your faith, I don't believe in. And I don't think that that's a defensible position in the end. Okay, so I want to ask you one more question about the appearance of the 500. Uh -huh. uh, Lee Strobel, the author of The Case for Christ, said that uh, he went to a, a psychologist friend of his and said, if 500 people claim to see Jesus after he died, it was just a hallucination. He said hallucinations are an individual event. If 500 people have the same hallucination, that's a bigger miracle than the resurrection. Do you think a skeptic even needs to appeal to group hallucination to question the appearance of the 500? Look, we simply don't know what this was. First of all, first of all, do we have affidavits from 500 people? Secondly, do we know the size of the crowd? Uh, who count? Who counted them? 500 just sounds to me like a big number, right? Did everybody in the crowd uh, see the same thing? One of the things you find if you look at Marian apparitions, or if you even look at Zaytun, is that not everybody sees the same thing. Did everybody see the same thing uh, at this event, whatever it was? Again, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's an event in the heavens. I don't know if it's an event on the ground. I don't know how many people saw whatever it was they saw. I don't know how many saw the same thing. So, uh, but, but, but you can go back again and, and the people who want to say, well, there are 500 who saw this. Why don't they do the same thing with Zaytun? Or why don't they do the same thing with uh, Fatima or any number of other appearances uh, of, of Mary? Just, I don't get it. So one of the things I hear often is that Christianity rises or falls on the resurrection of Jesus. But uh, apologists will often frame that as Christianity rises or falls on the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. So this is sort of like when a well-meaning pastor will tell his congregation that the Bible rises or falls on the doctrine of inerrancy. Uh, they may mean well, but I feel like they're setting up their congregation to be disappointed. So I'm wondering if you agree with that assessment and if you think the Christian faith rises and falls on the historical evidence for the resurrection. No, because I think, I, no, I agree with you, all right? But I, I think, 
Look, I don't know. I, I guess I, I guess I can't get this point across because I keep having to, 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 to repeat it to people, not, not to you. But I think that history is a very limited thing. I'm a professional historian. I've spent my life at this. I know that for whatever old historical question I'm looking at, there are multiple possibilities and things are open. And it's very hard to prove beyond a doubt uh, things that are controverted for more, for which there is more than one view at the time they, they happened. It's just really, really difficult. Uh, you know, that we had a president named Abraham Lincoln is a fact, and I th you'd be um, a fool to, to doubt that. But the resurrection of Jesus is just not on the same ground in my judgment. And to reduce faith or to say that faith requires that history do, do this or do that, I'm, I'm just not on board. Uh, again, um, I'm an historian, I, and I know we just trade in probabilities and plausibilities and possibilities. That's that's what we do. And the for me, I, 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 just to repeat, for me, the the New Testament evidence doesn't say, "Whoa, the skeptics are right," and it doesn't say, "Yeah, I have an IQ under 80 if I don't read these texts and decide he really rose from the dead." Those just aren't the the two options, as I've said in you know earlier, there are multiple options here. There's also just the option of saying this is really interesting. I'm not quite sure what happened, and I think somebody who is educated and well informed can do that. And then probably what they think about the the text or this tradition or this story is going to be dictated by things beyond their historical excavation. Uh, Christianity is much larger than just just what you can prove historically. How could it not be? Heck, Christians believe in God. How do you prove God historically? How do historians uh, establish that there is a God? Makes no sense. My own view is that Christianity is like a university. Um, there's not one department at a university. You don't just have the historians. Uh, if historians could do everything, then you would just have a history department. But historians can only do some things. You also need a English department and a philosophy department and a science department and so on and so on. You need multiple disciplines. You need multiple approaches. Uh, when you think about big things, you don't just do history. You do so many other things at the same time. So I'm wondering if you think a Christian can be sure of the resurrection of Jesus as an event of history based on a witness of the spirit alone and not necessarily through historical argumentation. And I want to read something that William Lane Craig said. He said the uh, Christian faith is based on the event of the resurrection. It is not based on the evidence for the resurrection. This distinction is crucial. And then he goes on to say, thus, it is entirely conceivable that the resurrection of Jesus was a real event of history but there is no way of proving this historically. If the evidence for the resurrection is inadequate, but we cannot prove the resurrection to be an event of history, but God's spirit still furnishes the unmistakable conviction that the resurrection occurred and that Jesus lives today. Therefore, whatever the state of the evidence, we can be sure that the resurrection is an event of history. What do you make of that? Uh, so I like, I like the first half of that, and uh, I'm actually not familiar with those sentences. What, what, what are those from? Uh, so I think I got it from a Christianity Today article. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to hear Bill say that. Uh, beyond that, um, I don't know. So it would be really hard for me to agree, I think, with the last part, which is, which seems to be saying from certain subjective experiences that I have today, I can then project uh, or make historical decisions about the past. But I certainly would have no trouble with people who would say, I've encountered the, the risen Jesus in the present. So that, that kind of thing uh, uh, I am open-minded about, but I don't see how you go from that 
back to deciding exactly what happened at the the empty tomb or what happened exactly with the with the first disciples. So I guess off now this is off the top of my head. Remember, I haven't thought about this, so I, I may regret this, but uh, I'm inclined to think I like the first half of that sentence, but uh, or those the first half of that statement. But I'm uneasy with the second half. Okay, so I looked it up. Uh, it was republished in the Gospel Coalition, but it's from his book, The Sun Rises, The Historical Evidence for the Resurrection. Oh, well, okay. Well, shame on me. I have read that book. So that means I read those sentences at some point and I just forgot them. Okay. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, Dale. So I'm going to ask you one last question. So you've had your historian hat on. So let's take the historian hat off, off for a second. Let's put the Christian believer hat on. What does the resurrection of Jesus mean to you, and why do you feel it's it's worth affirming? Uh, <laughs> well, I suppose I don't want to answer that uh, quickly. So I guess um, I guess there are two things here. So I like. Let's put this really crudely. I like the guy in the Gospels, and I want much of what he says to be true. I want, in some sense, the Sermon on the Mount to be true. But much of what Jesus says is counterintuitive. Much of what he says doesn't make a lot of sense. Much of it seems to be impractical. And the resurrection functioned for the disciples as the vindication of this historical character. And I like the vindication of that historical character. I like to have um, the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount vindicated or the suffering character in the Passion Narrative vindicated. Uh, so personally, I want that and like it. But the second thing... I don't know. I don't know if your audience is all Protestant, ex-Protestant, or or what, but I am very, very much attracted to um, the part of the creed that most Protestants are least comfortable with, which is Jesus descended into Hades. I like the notion of the resurrection of Jesus as the rescue of the dead. I know this is how it functioned in the thought of many Christians in the second, third, and fourth century. Um, now how you fill this out, because this is a mythological concept, uh, that's a, a complex issue, but I like the resurrection as a statement that death is not the final word, that death is not the final word, not just for this particular individual, but that it is not the final word, uh, for the rest of us. And that just as this individual was rescued from the dead, so that's the fate uh, for all of us. And that's how that that um, saying in the Apostles' Creed originally functioned. Uh, he descended into Hades or he descended into to hell. It's there to rescue the souls of the dead and to take them out of the realm of the dead. That's why the old icons of the resurrection don't just have Jesus rising from the dead by himself. They have him actually pulling up Adam and Eve and they have Moses and David and Solomon and other saints who have been raised uh, standing around him because his resurrection is understood uh, in a collective way so that his victory becomes everybody else's victory. So uh, you asked me to be personal and theological. So that's part of my personal theology. Okay, thank you, Del, for, the, uh, for that. I have one more question that I promised my friend that I would ask. Testify says, what does Dale think about Richard Miller's view, i.e. early Christians view Jesus's resurrection in the New Testament as myth, drawing parallels with Greek and Roman tales like uh, Heracles and Romulus? So this may surprise you, but I don't think that's an irrational point of view. I don't share it because I'm not a mythicist, first of all, and because I think that the dominant background for these texts, for the empty tomb and, and for the appearance stories, for the gospel stories and so on, uh, is explicable within uh, Judaism. But if I were a skeptic and I were not to adopt the scenario that I outlined earlier, that's probably what I would do. I would try to pile up the stories in which a dead Greco-Roman uh, hero 
uh, does not stay around. Uh, his body uh, ascends to heaven like Romulus or, or Heracles. Uh, there are such stories. You can find them pretty much all over the world. Uh, people who survive death and so on. I think, I think, my judgment is, which I tried to outline in the book, that the, the mythical paradigm isn't the right one for the Gospels. But it's not a, an insane point of view. It's just not, not one I share. All right, Dale. Thank you so much. Anything you want to plug before we go? Oh, no, no, no. I don't need to plug anything except, uh, you know, the book, the book that uh, we've been talking about. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll I'm really the, the, that's the book, The Resurrection of Jesus. I'm, I'm yeah. happy with it. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, happy that it's generated some discussion, which was my, you know, that's the point in writing the book. So I'll have the link in the description. Uh, folks, I'll also have David Kongston on Friday. He's going to be talking about his new book that actually comes out today, uh, Varieties of Christian Universalism. So he'll be here Friday. Next month, I'll have Tyler McNabb, Randall Rouser, uh, Trent Horn. And I'm also working on a few other guests. Stay tuned for that. Dale, thank you so much for joining me here today on Potential Theism. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Take have care. Thank you.